A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. I'm so glad you're with me on the program today. We're going to be talking with Larry Keene from the National Shooting Sports Foundation here in just a minute or two. The gun control lobby, without a doubt, uh, is uh, trying to frame the firearms industry as the new big baddie. Uh, in their fight. You're not hearing them talk much about the NRA these days. No, no. Now they're talking a lot about the NSSF, even Larry Keene specifically. Uh, Every town has a uh, brand new website aimed at the uh, firearms industry. The Trace has a new podcast coming out called The Gun Machine that uh, is supposed to take a look at the firearms industry as well. So yeah, they are apparently the uh, new 800-pound gorilla in the uh, quest to eradicate our right to keep and bear arms. We're going to get into that with Larry here in just a second. Before we do, however, you know, Biden's America, it's crushing us. You've got companies laying off tens of thousands of workers one after the other. America's working two jobs just to get by. Inflation pushing hardworking families to the brink. Just look at the price of lunch meat next time you go to the grocery store. And a digital dollar could be coming down the pipeline to completely destroy our way of life. The truth is, you need a plan. You know it, and I know it. And that is why you should call Gold Co. So you can diversify your savings and investments with gold and silver before things get worse. They're a six-timing 5,000 winner, 2022 Company of the Year, with thousands of five-star reviews. And they've helped people like you and me place over $1 billion in gold and silver. They're offering up to $10,000 in free silver while supplies last. And if you call them today, qualified callers will get a free Ronald Reagan half-ounce silver coin. So don't wait. Call Gold Co. at 855-412-3806 today. That's 855-412-3806. And now, let's get to our conversation with the National Shooting Sports Foundation's Larry Keene, all about the demonization of the firearms industry, the gun makers, and what the industry is doing in response. Take a look and a listen. Larry, so glad you could be with us on the program, sir. Thanks so much for your time today. Always a pleasure to visit with you, Cam. I feel like I I am doing just fine. I I feel like I need to get you for Christmas, maybe like a black 10-gallon hat, because (laughs) the uh, the gun control folks, boy, oh boy, they're trying to turn you and the firearms industry into the biggest villains around here. Um, Tell me about this uh, every town effort here, the smoking gun, uh, all directed again towards the firearms industry. Well, you know, it's part of a pattern that we've seen. A couple of months ago, they put out a fundraising piece on their website uh, attacking NSSF and, you know, in particular, uh, going after me. So I become the new boogeyman for uh, every town and part of their fundraising, uh, you know, mechanism. I should demand 10%, you know, from all the money they raised. Um, I, you know, and then we saw the piece by The Guardian a little while ago. Um, and, you know, now they've repackaged this report. Every town has and, you know, put up a fundraising website. So we become the new boogeyman, um, you know, replacing the NRA, I guess, or, or other groups. Um which, uh, you know, I, I actually take as a compliment, right? You know, it must mean we're doing a good job that they have to attack us uh, with these, you know, scandalous lies to uh, push their anti-gun agenda. And so um, now, you know, the former or soon to be former head of uh, every town's federal lobbying is going to be a White House employee running this you know, the White House Office for Gun Control. So I remember a couple of years ago, I guess maybe it's more than a couple of years ago, uh, a former NRA president during um, Bush's run for the White House made a comment um, in private about we would have an office in the White House. And the left went insane, just insane. Um, uh, and so now, of course, they literally have an office in the White House not just, you know, good relationships, uh, et cetera. So uh, anyway, um, you know, it, I don't know what will become of this office um, or what it really means. I mean, there was a uh, discussion when Chipman's nomination went up in flames that he would be offered that job. I heard he turned it down because he was offended 
he's easily offended that the White House didn't um, defend him enough during his nomination. When, of course, the reality is that Dave Chipman sunk his own battleship um, with his ridiculous comments. So we'll see. I mean, I, you know, uh, I don't know that it's going to change policy any. They're already doing all of these things. Um, it was resisted by Susan Rice, who is the domestic policy advisor. She's now gone. Uh, so, um, but I don't, you know, they just, I think it's window dressing. They put a new name on, uh, at, you know, um, I don't really know that it changes anything. It doesn't change the fact that they can't pass any legislation. And it doesn't change the fact that there are limits to his powers for executive orders. Um, but we've seen him try to push that. We're seeing it right now with the proposed rule, um, redefining and, and misinterpreting engage in the business to try to create universal background checks mm -hmm. and national registration. So uh, we'll, we'll comment on that in due course. I suspect that will end up in litigation. I don't think that rule will ever be implemented. It's it's clearly not what Congress said. It's not what the statute says. So, um, you know, every day there's a new battle. So. Right. Um, yeah, you answered like four of the questions that I was going to ask you. So I guess we're good here, Larry. Uh, no, I, I, I've got a few more. Um, you read my mind. You know, as to the Office of Gun Violence Permission, I think that you're right. You're not, this isn't – It's. It, I'm sure it is going to be a policy shot. But as you say, they've already had a seat at the table, right? It's not, oh, like, yeah. it's not like Joe Biden was ignoring what the gun control lobby was saying here. Um, it now just provides him that office in the White House. And what I've seen from a lot of the, the state level and even city level Office of Gun Violence Prevention is that these are sort of pass through mechanisms to distribute grant money out to, uh, you know, favored organizations and institutions. I mean, I think this is basically going to be welfare for the gun control lobby. Uh, it may be that there are some, you know, good organizations that get funding for community anti-violence programs. But, I, I, you know, what we've seen is that in a lot of states, either the money hasn't it's been very slow in coming. Um, and when it does get distributed, there's very little oversight. There's very little accountability, certainly no real metrics of success, no right. you yeah. know, and, and that's a concern because I, mean, I remember going back and again, talk about being a few years ago. Uh, I remember when I was with NRA uh, News covering uh, a group called No Guns in Los Angeles. It was run by a guy named Hector Big Weasel Marikeen, uh, who was a former gang member who had, you know, turned his life around and now is trying to keep kids on the straight and narrow until he got busted selling guns to undercover ATF agents. Um, that group had received more than a million dollars yeah. funding from the LA city yeah. council. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So yeah. I, I'm, I'm concerned that this is going to be like no guns on steroid going forward. But uh, as you say, we'll, yeah, we'll have to keep an eye on that. I think you raise a very good point. It, it is to me, it's well, it's, it just shows you we're in campaign season, right? I yeah. mean, for, you know, the last three years of the administration, they resisted this. And now all of a sudden they're doing it. It just tells me we're, we're in the silly season, right? So um, I think they, I, I, even think, I think they were holding this in their back pocket until we got to campaign season. I think it was one of the reasons why they kept they, saying no, 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 because they wanted to have something to roll out. Uh, you know, ahead of uh, 2024, they got the endorsement of the gun control groups a few months ago, and maybe this is a little tit for tat. Uh, what do you think about uh, Kamala Harris being named the uh, the person in charge, given her bang up job on, you know, border enforcement and things of that nature? I think it just is further evidence that it's the silly season. Uh, you know, she'll get to it right when she fixes the border she's never been to. So. You know, that, just, that to me is a tell, right? This is not serious. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just window dressing. It's for the Friday, you know, well, but they did the press conference on a Friday afternoon. It also tells you something. So, um, you know, they are just, you know, sprinkling crumbs to, to keep their base in line, to raise money, to, you know, run on the issue uh, in 24. Um, you know, the policies are all there. It's, these are the, you know, uh, the same people that were sending them letters saying do X, Y, and Z will now be sitting in the White House saying do X, Y, and Z. So right. you know, I don't really think it changes anything. It's just, it's, it, you know, it's a matter of substance. As you say, though, I mean, there is this clear 
shift over the past year, maybe two. Um, whereas you say the, the NRA is not necessarily the primary boogeyman of the gun control lobby, right? They really have shifted to the industry and it's the gun industry to blame for violent crime. And you want to know why crime's up in your community? Well, look at those rogue gun dealers, you know, out there and look at the firearms industry, just turn a blind eye to all of these guns that they're selling and where they end up. This to me, I think is serious, right? And, and, and I'm sure we're going to hear a lot of that rhetoric. It goes back to Joe Biden running in 2019 and 2020, when he declared that the firearms industry was the enemy, right? Yeah. That, that yeah. you all were the problem. Right. Um, and so I don't want, I mean, we're smiling, we're joking here, but I don't want people to think that, 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 that any of us can afford to take this lightly because if they could eradicate and obliterate the firearms industry tomorrow, they absolutely would. They, they absolutely would. Thank God for the second amendment. And it's so critically important that we defend the second amendment. Um, but I, you know, you're absolutely right. I mean, we, we jo- I joke that you know, the Guardian piece, for example, was you know uh, a great piece of marketing for NSSF. But you know, they have focused on us. They are spewing these lies. I just think it's a lot harder for them to demonize NSSF when it's you know the industry that for decades has been providing free locks with each new fire. Arm ship. It's the industry that for over two decades has been working with ATF to try to stop straw purchasing through our Don't Lie for the Other Guy program. And in fact, in the near future, we're doing another press event with the director and our CEO, Joe Bartosi. You know, it's the industry that's been running Project Child Safe for almost 25 years, um, you know, distributing over 40 million firearm safety education kits all across the United States in every single state in U.S. territory. How are they going to demonize the firearms industry for working cooperatively with ATF in a new initiative called Operation Secure Store to reduce the number of burglaries and stolen guns occurring in gun shops and matching ATF reward offers? So, you know, it's just, you know, and it's the industry that cooperates with ATF. It's the dealers that are the front lines at stopping guns from getting into the hands of criminals who are the ones that call ATF and provide them with information that leads to trafficking investigations. It's for decades been the case that dealers are the primary source of information to ATF that leads to trafficking investigations, which is, of course, one of the problems with this administration's zero tolerance policy. It's discouraging cooperation because dealers now have to worry, well, if I call Am mm-hmm. I then going to be subject to an investigation? And if they find some mistake, a human error, um, am I going to lose my license? I mean, I'll, I'll tell you one example. So this, this is an actual case, very recent. A, a dealer was inspected. There was one form where the NICS transaction number was not filled in on the form, and they moved to revoke the license. At the revocation hearing, the lawyer representing the dealer, and by the way, if you're a dealer, never, ever, ever, ever go to a revocation hearing without a lawyer. Um, at the hearing, the lawyer showed a videotape from the closed circuit TV of the store of the screen showing that the clerk did, in fact, run an e-check. It was right there on the screen. He just got distracted and didn't write the number down, but he did, in fact, do the background check. Notwithstanding that evidence, after the hearing, they revoked his license. Now, there was intervention at okay. high levels of ATF where this was laid out and say, this is ridiculous. And you're going to be very embarrassed when this goes to court. Um, and they rescinded the revocation. But it should never have come to that. I mean, no, there I, it was on the screen that he had run the check. It was just a human error. It was not willful. He just didn't transpose the number onto the form. That's not a willful violation. In the past, it would never have led to a revocation because it's not a willful violation. Mm-hmm. That just shows you, you know, the, the kind of cases that we're seeing. Or Cam, where the number of licenses that have been surrendered after an inspection are more than the licenses revoked. 
Yeah, because again, That's like right, absolutely, the attitude is, well, I, you, you can't fight City Hall. I don't have the resources to pay for this. I can't afford an attorney. I, I, I have or to give up, there, right? Or, or as we've seen on occasion, uh, ATF pressuring them to surrender their license. Yeah, because things are going to go a lot worse for you if you don't, right? right. Um, yeah. yeah. Just just surrender your license. And, and you know, you're, you're absolutely right. In fact, I was just writing about um, Cargill uh, versus ATF, where a, a judge in the uh, Fifth Circuit uh, rejected DOJ's uh, attempt to dismiss this lawsuit, uh, said, no, nope, these are uh, th- this is ripe for review. Uh, this is actionable. Uh, the case can go forward. And this is exactly what you're talking about. Michael Cargill talked about the last time he had an ATF inspection. I think it was 2018. Um, compliance rate of more than 95, 99.5%, right? He had he had four issues, I believe 35 right. issues out of more than 6,500 transactions. Um, and in 2018, you know, the ATF said, look, we, we found these issues, rectify them. Here's how you rectify them. He said, right. Okay, great. But now that will be cause, again, to revoke his yes. license. And in fact, that 2018 inspection, they could go back now and say, you know what? We decided, Michael, that after all, we're, we're going to go ahead and take your license away. He, he mentioned uh, an FFL who had his license revoked 15 months uh, after an inspection. The ATF came back and said, actually, you know what? We decided to go ahead and yank well, your license from you. Well, we've seen cases where they came in, inspected, found something, warning letter, Inspection closed months later in the mail, unannounced, notice of revocation. And I'll, 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 give, I'll give you, this is a real case. A, a big box corporate retailer um, sold a gun to a woman. She filled out the 4473. She passed the background check. For whatever reason, she didn't get back to the store to pick up the gun until like 33 days later. So... After 30 days, you have to run a new next check. Um, they mistakenly miscounted the dates and, and transferred the gun without doing another background check. She passed. They just didn't do a second one. The store found about found out about it, realized it in a review, um, contacted the woman, had her come back, bring the gun back. They logged it back into inventory. She filled out another 4473, passed the background check again, and then they transferred the gun to her and recorded it as a disposition. When ATF came in, did the inspection, they saw that they said, okay, fine, you know, warning letter, if it even r- rose to that. Okay. Um, months later, revocation in the mail for that, for that, and nothing else. For 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 trying to do the right thing, right? I would say even going above and beyond and trying to do the right thing. I mean, and at the SHOT Show, Director Hillbox spoke, and I'll give him credit, he came to the SHOT Show, and he stood up and he, and he spoke. I don't, I can't remember another ATF director actually speaking to folks at SHOT Show, private meetings, but not, you know, publicly. And he said, we are revising or refining zero tolerance, and, and gave us an example of somebody transfers one gun Pass like without doing another check after 30 days, and the person's not prohibited, we wouldn't revoke that. now. That was the revision or an example of how they were revising the policy. But yet we, we've seen it. So it's 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 troubling. You know, there was a recent case uh in Kentucky where a dealer, um a long 40-year dealer, very cooperative, great track record. And there were, I guess, some mistakes. They had a former deputy sheriff, uh, retired, who liked to, you know, talk to the customer too much and didn't, you know, didn't dot the I's, cross the T's, but nothing willful. Revocation, the dealer went to the hearing without a lawyer, revoked. Brought a lawsuit, right, as you're allowed under the law to challenge, and the court there granted a preliminary injunction and enjoined ATF from revoking his license during the pendency of the case, which now will go into discovery. And the opinion was uh, very critical of ATF's interpretation of what willfulness means. And during the argument on the motion, I actually met with a lawyer the other day in, in Kentucky, 
said that, you know, and it's in, it's in the case that ATF admitted there are no bad actors here, that, you know, basically it was a mistake, but, you know, the law says one, one mistake, and that's all it takes. And, you know, ATF had never taken that extreme of view on, um, you know, I mean, people can make human errors. It doesn't make it willful. Right. Uh, even under the very, you know, generous definition that the ATF is given by the courts that, you know, plain indifference. I mean, um, but, you know, a, a, someone who just makes the mistake of not remembering, like just not writing the number down on the form is not willful. Yeah. So, you know, if, it's, if it was every time, but like you say, Nine, you know, you know, six instances out of six thousand transactions. That's not plain indifference, and that's right. not willful. Those are human errors. Look at, think about how many boxes have to be filled in and checked on the form, and it's a busy Saturday, and there's customers lining up. I mean, it. You know, that's one of the advantages of like electronic forty four seventy three reduces the chances of those sorts of human errors right so but um you know it, it's unfortunate the attack um on the industry by this administration uh it, it's worse than anything we ever saw during the clinton administration during the obama administration um you know it's very unfortunate but um and the rise of all these anti-gun groups um you know in the cozy relationship they have uh, with this white house i mean quite literally they have an office in the West Wing now. I mean, staffed by an every town lobbyist. Can you imagine if, say, President Bush or President Trump opened up, you know, an office in the White House and hired an NRA lobbyist or an NSSF lobbyist to work there? I mean, the left, the media would be going and saying, not a single word have I seen by any mainstream media saying, hey, wait a second. You're hiring a gun control lobbyist? Like, how is like how is that neutral? How is that, you know, not biased? Yeah. Oh, I, they, I, they don't care. They don't care. They're fine with it. Uh, you know, uh, that's the uh, sad and, thing. The truth th is, they're in the tank. And absolutely. You know, you need another example of bias in the mainstream media. There it is. Yep. Absolutely. Hey, listen, before we run out of time, I want to ask you, because uh, we were talking about some you know, not great stuff. Uh, let's talk about a good uh, a good decision from uh, U.S. District Judge Roger Benitez uh, last Friday, striking down the state of California's ban on large capacity magazines. And, and this was I got it. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know if you've had a chance to uh, read the entire opinion, but right. holy moly. I mean, it is thorough. It just demolishes the state of California's argument. Yes. Seems to me yes. like he was really writing with the Supreme Court in mind as an audience here, knowing that this case uh, is going back to SCOTUS. What, what are your thoughts on uh, California's mag ban being struck down? It uh, was a great to see, obviously. Um, it's the second time. You're, I mean, we waited a long time, a long, long time for this decision, and now we know why. He was really um, being very thorough. I think it's devastating to their case. I particularly enjoyed how he um, took apart the uh, California's expert, Lucy Allen, who has been around testifying against the industry literally since the Hamilton trial in the late 1990s in front of Judge Weinstein. That's how long she's been around and testifying against the industry. So that was particularly enjoyable. Um, and how he just takes apart the specious arguments of the state, how they play this game with dangerous or unusual when that's not the test, this, you know, bogus argument that use means, you know, you have to actually pull the trigger right? Um, when, you know, a first year law student reading, you know, uh, Heller and McDonald uh, would understand that that's not what's meant by use. I mean, you, you have the gun you possess it for the purpose of self-defense. You are using it for self-defense. I mean, the idea that, you know, you have to have pulled the trigger in order to have used it for self-defense. I mean, obviously the vast overwhelming majority of firearms, I mean, I would venture to say it's well 
above 95% are never fired, you know, in, in actual self-defense. Mm-hmm. Isn't that a good thing? <laughs> right. Like, I mean, it's just, it's just such a silly argument that it's, it, you know, that they would even make it. So, yes, he, I think at a minimum, he knows this will go en banc in the Ninth Circuit because everything in the Ninth Circuit seems to end up en banc and that it is very likely to appear back, um, you know, in the Supreme Court. At some point, and I think that point is coming close, the Supreme Court will take another one of these hardware cases. Well, we'll take a hardware case, really. Yeah. Um, either magazines or um, so-called assault weapons or both, a case that does both. And there are many cases now we're waiting on the Fourth Circuit, the First Circuit, the Seventh Circuit, the Ninth Circuit has got this case, also the Oregon case that's coming, the Washington case is coming. So, you know, eventually there'll be a split in the circuits or maybe even not, maybe just enough of these misinterpretations where you have courts um, like in the First Circuit case, the, the Rhode Island case, where the court said, uh, they're not even arms. Right. I mean, yeah. I don't know if you had a chance to listen to the oral argument in the Rhode Island case, but I thought one of the, the, the presiding judge just destroyed the uh, assistant attorney general from Rhode Island, who was arguing that magazines are just an accessory. Um, the judge said, well, going back to you know 1791, if you had a you know muzzle loader or flintlock. Would the ramrod be considered an accessory? And she had no answer to that at all. I mean, it was it was just just devastating, just destroyed the argument. And you know, we saw California making that same argument. It's just an accessory. I really particularly liked how we talked about, well, you know, the state requires magazine disconnects on handguns. And so, like if the argument is, well, you could still fire the gun one shot at a time, even though you don't have a without the magazine in the gun. Well, that's not the case when it's a magazine disconnect that the state requires. So, um, you know, they were hoisted on their own petard, as they say. So, uh, which was which was uh, fun to read. So, absolutely, and we've got some uh, some other pending decisions before Judge Benitez as well. So, hopefully, the uh, the fun will continue in the very near future. Uh, in, in the meantime, Larry, as always, sir, thank you for joining me on the program. Just one last quick question. You, you know. I, I know what we can do as gun owners to help support the Second Amendment. I know we can, you know, join organizations. We can, you know, help fund lawsuits. We can contact our lawmakers. What can we do as gun owners to stand up for the firearms industry when when it comes under attack? Uh, other than, again, support the companies that we uh, appreciate and admire uh, by purchasing well, their products. Always been, uh, yeah, of course. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to downplay that part of, uh, of you know, voting with your wallet, but but what else can we do? Well, I would say be engaged politically, at, you know, right down to your city council, county executives, et cetera. But you, you can support NSSF directly through, for example, supporting the Project Child Safe Foundation, which is a, a charity that we've set up to support the child safe program. So you could you can go on Project Child Safe Foundation, make a contribution. You can make a contribution to uh, gun owners care that we've set up. That uh, you know you can do that through the NSSF website. And um, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but there's uh, there'll be some news on Wednesday and a way that gun owners can help support. Um, in making sure that we have the right political environment for um, the Second Amendment so that the, the members of the industry can continue to engage in constitutionally pre- protected commerce that makes the exercise of the Second Amendment possible. So, uh, you know, um, so there's ways. I mean, uh, you know, check back with me on Wednesday. We'll have some more information. <laughs> I think they call that a tease in your business. I believe, yes, some foreshadowing there from uh, Larry Keen. All right, well, we've got something to talk about later in the week from NSSF, that's for sure. Uh, and again, Larry, thank you uh, again for joining us on the program. Uh, really, really always enjoy talking with you and appreciate all of your efforts in helping to keep our Second Amendment rights strong and secure. Well, thanks for having us on, Cam, and it's a pleasure to always visit with you.
Have a great day. You too, sir. My thanks to Larry for joining me on the program and looking forward to welcoming him back again very soon. All right, let's turn our attention now to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day, as well as our recidivist report. We'll start there with a a case out of Minnesota. Man ordered to serve three years probation for armed robbery at the Mall of America. That's right, yeah. And remember, as Minnesota lawmakers this past session, they they cut tough on law-abiding citizens, uh, but they also... You know, supposedly spent hundreds of millions of dollars in this uh, omnibus public safety bill to crack down on criminals. I, I, I guess that part just hasn't kicked in yet. 29-year-old Cartier Troy Alexander II had sentences of 48 months and 58 months stayed on two counts of first-degree aggravated robbery. Court documents show in July, Alexander yielded a guilt, entered a, a guilty plea to the two charges, along with a third count uh, being dismissed in the case, a separate case that also charged Alexander with another count of aggravated robbery, has been dismissed as well as part of this plea deal. Uh, KSTP-TV in Minneapolis reported that Alexander was charged after a store and kiosk in the Mall of America were robbed last summer. He was arrested by police after someone reported a man carrying a rifle inside the mall. When he was arrested, court records say that the rifle was loaded, had a round in the chamber. Criminal complaint states that before officers arrived, Alexander went into the lid store on the third floor of the mall, rested the gun on the counter, and then pointed out various jerseys that he wanted to be brought down for him. He then told employees to take the tags off the jerseys, put them in a bag. When they started taking too long, he said, just put everything in the bag. Don't worry about payment. Co-worker at a a kiosk also told police that Alexander had taken an item and walked away without paying. Alexander later admitted to uh, taking the items. And again, sentenced to years in prison for the uh, violent armed robbery, but all of that stayed And as long as he keeps his nose clean, no jail time at all for the multiple armed robberies. Yeah, I I, I, I don't even know what to say Uh, other than, you know, again, Minnesota lawmakers made the conscious choice to crack down on law-abiding citizens and to ignore criminals like Mr. Alexander. And this is the unsurprising result. Now, today's armed citizen story, this is a weird one. You know, not every uh, uh, defensive gun use is ruled to be a justifiable shooting uh, at the scene of the crime, right? Police will do an investigation. Sometimes they will, well, in every case, they'll present their findings to the district attorney, who will then generally turn around and present those findings to a grand jury. Uh, And sometimes people get charged and their case goes to trial and they get acquitted as is the case of a man in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, who was acquitted on all charges in a shooting last year. Uh, Nathaniel Bing had originally actually taken a plea deal, but then he uh, rejected that deal and said, you know what, I'm innocent. I want to go to trial. And he did. And the uh, jury in this case, again, acquitted him of uh, all charges. Uh, He was charged with murder in the first and third degree, voluntary manslaughter and possessing an instrument of crime. Again, he chose a jury trial, and the uh, jury of his peers found him not guilty this week. Uh, the 35-year-old was accused of shooting 31-year-old Michael Jones, a uh, kind of sometimes sort of roommate. Bing didn't deny shooting Jones, but he said that the other man was drunk and had attacked him inside the apartment. This was, um, again, back in 2022. Um, and. Bing had uh, apparently allowed uh, his friend to stay in the apartment for some time, Um, but there were issues. Uh, About 11 p.m. the night before the shooting, Bing told uh, homicide detective uh, Kevin Gamber they came home from work to find his lights on. There was a liquor bottle. There was a woman's hair and eyelashes in the shower. There was a bottle of lube and what appeared to be uh, semen stains on his couch. Yeah, exactly what you like to find from your house guest, right? So Bing called Jones and said, hey, did you have a woman here while I was gone? Uh, they had apparently previously discussed how Jones had been disrespecting Bing and the apartment was not a hotel. Uh, Bing also talked about the situation with Jones's girlfriend. Yeah, uh, showing her the evidence in a video call. Jones um, was apparently annoyed and angry at Bing for uh, telling his girlfriend, hey, you know what, I think... Uh, your boyfriend had a, another woman here in the house. 
Um, so Bing talked to Jones and said, uh, listen, sleep this off, sober up, call me in the morning. We'll keep talking. Uh, Jones had texted Bing at that point that he wanted to rumble him. Bing then told the downstairs neighbor not to let Jones in, said he was changing the locks the next day, packed up Jones's uh, remaining stuff, placed him near the door to be picked up that weekend. Uh, he said he went to bed around 3 a.m., but he woke up to the sound of a door opening and a chair that he had placed in front of the door moving. That's when he got his handgun from his dresser. When he saw that it was Jones coming to the apartment, an argument ensued. Bing claimed that he repeatedly told Jones to get his belongings and leave. Just get your stuff and go, man. Uh, according to Bing, Jones did move towards the door with his keys out, but then he put his keys back in his pockets, hissed up his pants, turned on Bing. Bing said he backed him in the narrow hallway, but Jones swung at him and connected in the neck or shoulder area. And at that point, Bing said he pulled out his handgun and fired a single shot. Jones stumbled down the back hall uh, towards the front door and collapsed, according to Bing. Bing then called 911 and told Jones, stay with me. Uh, Bing, again, argued that he was acting in self-defense. Prosecutors uh, said, well, listen, if he was truly scared of Jones, he would have called the police after Jones threatened him. Or, or he would have uh, done something more than just put a, you know, a chair against the door. He maybe would have put a dresser against the door. Which, by the way, sounds a lot like victim blaming to me. You know, this was a dispute between roommates. Or not even roommates, a dispute between friends, one of whom is letting the other stay at his apartment. That's not something you necessarily want to escalate to the point of getting law enforcement involved. And I am sure that Mr. Bing was hoping that Jones would have followed his advice. Sleep it off, sober up, call me in the morning, and we'll talk about this. But that's not what happened. Defense attorney Timothy Tarpey argued that Jones had a 0.18 blood alcohol level that night when he came to the apartment and had already sent threatening texts to Bing. Tarpey noted that Bing knew Jones had already been arrested for criminal trespass and assault, so the idea that he might come and assault him was not outside the realm of possibility. And again, if we're talking about a friend, that might be the wrong decision to make, but I can understand not wanting to get the police involved at that point. I don't want to see you go back to jail for doing something stupid. So I'm trying to save you from yourself. Bing had been in custody without bail since the day of Jones's death. In 2022, again, in February, he pleaded guilty to voluntary manslaughter and possessing an instrument of crime, but withdrew that plea in April and decided to go to trial, even though that posed a risk. But he said he was innocent of all charges. And again, a jury in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, agreed. And finally, today, in the right place, at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing, an unknown resident of Anne Arundel County, Maryland who uh, helped put in motion a chain of events that apparently stopped an active shooting incident at a church in Northern Virginia. NBC Washington reporting a uh, man arrested was uh, ran, man was arrested just minutes before this uh, potential shooting at a church in Haymarket, Virginia, uh, which is uh, in Prince William County, uh, just outside of Fairfax County. This all played out. Sunday morning, 35-year-old uh, Rui Zhang taken into custody at Park Valley Church in Haymarket. He had a gun. He had ammo on him. Authorities said that he was on a mission to kill. Uh, Chief Kevin Davis of the Fairfax County Police Department said this was a thwarted, diabolical plot to kill churchgoers in Haymarket, Virginia, and local law enforcement stopped it. And again, they would not have been able to do so were it not for the actions of a unknown citizen in Anne Arundel County. Investigators say somebody saw a series of troubling posts on Instagram. Uh, several posts showing Jang pointing to fire at pictures of churches. Davis said what she saw concerned her enough to call the Anne Arundel Police Department to say, hey, I think something really bad's going to happen. Now, Anne Arundel County is in Maryland. So apparently she wasn't aware of where Zhang lived or maybe didn't know who else to reach out to, but she contacted a Maryland law enforcement agency. Police said that Jang went on a stakeout of the uh, church in Haymarket early Sunday morning, posted pictures from the parking lot. Hours later, the concerned citizen alerted Anne Arundel County Police. They determined that the suspect did not live in Maryland, but instead lived in the Bailey's Crossroads area of Fairfax County. They reached out to Fairfax County. Fairfax County officers went to perform a welfare check of the home, but found that he wasn't there. Uh, Fairfax County authorities said in a release at 10 a.m., officers requested Prince William County Police Department officers to immediately respond to the Park Valley Church area to search for Jang. 
Recognizing the severity of the situation, and uh, Fairfax County Police Department Lieutenant contacted the Prince William County Police Department directly to relay the information. And there at the church, just after 10 a.m., authorities found Zhang. He was carrying a, a pistol with another magazine, as well as a knife. Hours later, police say they searched Zhang's home. Uh, Davis said the officers found a kill manifesto, quote, the likes of which I've never read. But he also articulated they didn't know anybody at that church. He articulated his would-be victims, and he put it out there. He knew he was going to take many lives. And he also said, I don't know any of them. And again, this attack, apparently planned out, minutes from being executed, was stopped because somebody saw something and spoke up. And you know, we know, I've talked about this on the program before, Secret Service issued a report a couple of reports, actually, on active assailant attacks in schools. And what they found is that in more than 90% of the cases that they looked at, the assailant said something beforehand. It might have been to a classmate, it might have been to a family member, it might have been to a teacher, and they might have posted something on social media. But they said something, they relayed their intentions And when that happens, those are opportunities to intervene and to stop that attack. But again, in order for that to take place, the person who sees something has to say something. And that was the case here. So again, this chain of events started with that alert citizen who saw this and went, oh, crap. This this is really disturbing. Reached out to the Anne Arundel County Police Department, who did some digging, who didn't just, you know, again, the officer that took that information didn't put it in a file somewhere and then turn back to whatever he was doing. They started figuring out, okay, where, where is this church? What, what, who is this person? They were able to find out he lived in Fairfax County, Virginia. So they reached out to Fairfax County. Officers there went on that welfare check. He was not there. Okay. What else can we learn? Where is this church? Oh, I think this is, you know what? I think it's in Haymarket. Okay. Call Prince William County. Let them know. You know, again, we talk about some of the failures of law enforcement in in, in incidents like Uvalde, or even the failures leading up to the shooting at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Again, those opportunities to intervene that were missed, the red flags that were ignored, the phone calls to law enforcement that never got answered. And in this case, everybody did what they were supposed to do. Except, of course, for the suspect. And because of that, lives were saved. So I don't know if we'll ever know who made that first phone call to Anne Arundel County Police, but uh, whoever they are, in the right place, at the right time, willing able to do the right thing, we thank you for your very, very good deed. Now, that is all the time we've got for you here on this edition of Arian Arms Cam and Company. I want to thank you for being a part of the program as always. I am looking forward to being back with you tomorrow. Um, We're probably going to be talking about uh, one or more of the gun control bills that are uh, being signed or have been signed by the time you see this by uh, California Governor Gavin Newsom, including SB2, the uh, carry killer legislation. We'll have an update on that uh, for you on tomorrow's Bearing Arms Cam and Company. In the meantime, be sure to check out BearingArms.com. Stay up to date on all of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation. If you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP or VIP Gold member as well. Not only will you get that warm, fuzzy feeling of supporting the independent pro Second Amendment journalism that we're doing, but we're going to give you exclusive content you won't find anywhere else to show our thanks because your support makes a difference and it really does matter. Enjoy the rest of your 2A Tuesday. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well. Be safe and be free.